What a joy to be with all of you for this time of study. Our current series speaks so profoundly to where we are right now in our world today as people of God, as Christians. I pray it's a blessing to you. I pray those of you who clicked on this and listening to it or watching it, I pray it's a great blessing. Before I get into it, let me mention uh, we are going through the Discipleship Project. We've done this for some time. It's a coordinated study, all age groups studying the same subject, uh, age-related lessons, but basically studying the same uh, subjects. And uh, we're, we're shifting that just a little bit. We are still recording these lessons, and uh, hopefully you are viewing them. I encourage you to do that. But uh, we have also ordered the adult student book, this is a wonderful partner to this video that you can watch here, 20, 25, 30 minutes. You can watch this video with your family. And then through the week, we have had many requests. Uh, we're in family month right now. And we've had people ask, uh, how, how can I have devotions with my family? How do you make that happen? Tell me what that looks like. Well, this is a great resource for that because of these lessons, uh, that will introduce the subject, kind of give you something to think about. And during that week, there's a weekly companion with that lesson. Now, it has it has questions to do, begin a discussion about whatever the subject may be. It has activities. If you have small children, there are things, activities it suggests to do together. If you have students, teenagers, obviously, it's a little uh, more uh uh, suggestions about what you can do to talk about these subjects with your teens. And then every day there's a prayer focus. Uh, so you're getting your kids ready for school and they're getting ready to walk out the door. There's a prayer focus for Monday, a prayer focus for Tuesday. There's also verses that you can quote or read, commit to memory, a great resource. If you're looking for something to start or even planning to do some family devotion time, this would be a great Great resource for you. I encourage you. We got enough of these for every family to have one. There are no cost. You stop by the church. Of course, right now we're not having live service for a couple of weeks. But when you do, please get one of these. And we're gonna we're gonna uh, push those family devotions. That'll be something for you to uh, appropriate yourself to. So we wanted to make you aware of that. Our current series is the peace of God, and this is a very appropriate subject especially during our current situation, our current time, because Jesus offers us his peace. He told us, my peace, I leave with you. As disciples, we should have peace flowing through our lives. Today, we're going to focus on the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Peace. And this is very important because Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and you and I are children of God. We have Jesus in us. Amen. If he's the Prince of Peace, then there should be peace flowing through our lives. Amen. Our scripture focus is Isaiah 9, 6, a very familiar passage. In fact, in my own prayer time, this is the, the five pillars praying through the tabernacle. This is the five pillars as you enter into the holy place. There was five pillars in the tabernacle of Moses. And here they are in Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Amen. The Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Amen. The shadows grew long late in the day as Jesus sat down in one of the waiting boats on the shore that day, concluding his his lesson. For hours, he had been teaching a large crowd that had gathered, and Jesus had woven story after story, parables, speaking spiritual truths as he taught them. He spoke of a sower and the seed, of the incredible growth of one seed, the, the tree that would spread its branches out, and the light of the world that should be displayed for everyone to see. Each story revealed more understanding about the kingdom of God to all those who were listening and to those that believed. Upon concluding a long day of ministry, Jesus and his disciples pushed the boats out from the shore and escaped the press of the multitude. 
having set their course for the opposite side. Jesus, weary from a long day of teaching, found a comfortable spot in that boat. Nothing like a boat on the water, amen, to get you all relaxed. Almost immediately, Scripture says he was asleep. And he showed no signs even of awakening as the swells began to grow more and more intense. And the winds began to sweep waves of water over the edge of the boat. He is still asleep. Even though some of the disciples are well-trained and experienced fishermen, they quickly grew alarmed over this intensifying storm. Fear gave voice to their concern as they shook Jesus and cried, Don't you care? that we are about to drown. Jesus was unfazed, unfazed. He simply woke up, spoke to the wind with a confident rebuke, peace, be still. I want you to hear that. Some of the things that drive us to the edge of despair, Jesus stands up unfazed in the middle of the boat, peace, be still. What he was very concerned about was, though, it wasn't the storm. It was directed towards his disciples when he asked, why are you so fearful? Well, <laughs> wow, what a question. What do you mean, why are we so fearful? He, he goes on to ask, where is your faith? The storm suddenly dissipated as quickly as it had arisen. Their fear of the storm and all that destruction was turned into utter amazement at the miracle they had just seen. In fact, now their unanimous question is not, don't you care that we perish? Now they are saying, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the waves obey him? You know, some of our greatest revelations concerning the identity of Jesus Christ come in the middle of our storms. And it's no different here in the Word of God. We find the first revelation that I find in this story of Jesus and his disciples is the fact that he rested during the crisis. While others are fearful for their lives, Jesus was at rest. Think about that. He was asleep on a pillow, so to speak. His lack of consternation, agitation, anxiety was not an indication of unconcern. It, it wasn't, it didn't mean he didn't care, but there was a calm confidence that he had. Oh, I'm praying I can have it. I'm praying that I can let go of those fears, that agitation, that what he has, I can have also that that calm in the midst of a terrible storm, he rose and rebuked the wind. So for the disciples, there was no reason to fear as long as Jesus was on board. In fact, let me ask you a question. What do you think about this? In the biggest trial of your life, have you ever been annoyed with others who profess to be full of faith and believe and they just seem to be unconcerned, though, with the severity of your situation. It's like they don't see how drastic the situation is. It, don't they understand how terrible this is? Think about that for a minute. How about looking at this from another direction now? Have you ever been annoyed also with others who profess faith? God can do anything. And then the biggest trial of their life, they seem severely agitated. Where is their faith? Is he the same God yesterday when they were proclaiming that he could do anything? Well, sure he is. What's the difference? Well, it's the storm. Let's settle this in our hearts right here and right now. Jesus rested during the crisis. I got a feeling he's resting right now. I got a feeling that all the agitation we are feeling I got a feeling that in the middle of my storm right now, he's he's got a calm peace about him. Amen. The simple spoken word, Jesus, produced peace and a revelation of his power over the elements of nature with just one single word. Nothing can be so frightening as the display of nature's fury. Think about these disciples in this storm. 
hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, volcanoes, earthquakes. They unleash a dynamic power of destruction on anything and everyone in its path. God is not only strong through the storm, but equally powerful to prevent its destruction and to proclaim a peace in its place. Amen. The power of his word brings peace in the place of chaos. Right now, he can bring peace in, in the midst of all of it. Let's entertain another question if we can. If all nature is under his authority, what do we have to fear? Why do we still fear at times? Not only did Jesus understand the source of the storm, he was also in control of the outcome. Think of that. Jesus understood the source of this storm, but he also was in control of the outcome. In fact, before he went to sleep, he knew the storm was coming. Before the crisis in the boat, Jesus knew the calm that would follow the storm. Before they launched from the shore, amen, Jesus planned for their arrival. I want you to think about that for a minute. With divine foreknowledge, he stated, let us cross over to the other side. Whatever happened between their departure and their arrival was immaterial. They were going to arrive safely on the other shore. Think about that. Jesus rebuking the storm. He says to his disciples in, in no uncertain terms, hey, whatever happens between the departure and the arrival, have faith. Don't be afraid. You're going to arrive safely on the other shore. Oh, praise God. God's in control. Oh, yes, he is. And I'm praying that brings us peace. The fear of the storm, all, all, all of a sudden, think about it. They're afraid of the storm. When he calms the storm, all of a sudden, their fear is now redirected. His power brings a fear and respect on those disciples. Their legitimate fear of death is replaced with an awe and respect of Jesus Christ. Think about it. Come on now. I know the topic of our conversation should be concerned for health and life and protection and let's stay away from the plague and let's don't get COVID and the list goes on and on and this is appropriate for our day. But listen, our fear of all the storms should never displace or replace our awe and fear of the Lord. He is bigger than all of that. He is greater, amen, than all of that. He is more powerful than any sickness or disease or storm we are facing. And I still believe that. February till, to, till this moment has not changed who God is. Uh, amen. He's, he's just as powerful as he was before I even knew there was a COVID-19. He's still God. And he's still a healer. And he's still a deliverer. Can I get a witness? Amen. They immediately recognized his greatness, his power, his authority. The reason this miracle evoked fear was that the disciples recognized his authority over every spirit. Yes, I said spirit. And we'll we'll get to that in just a minute. Though they had many seen many miracles of healings, deliverance from demons, and even the dead raised to life, there was something greater in this spiritual conflict on this lake. In this boat, Jesus has all authority and power over every spirit, without a doubt. Here's something, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to not only know, but live every day. Jesus willingly shared authority with those who would obediently follow him. Jesus gave them authority. In Luke 10, he sent out 70 disciples by two, and he declared this, I give unto you power to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He extended his authority to work through those who went in his name. You know what that means? It means if we go in his name, we have authority. Interestingly, the New English translation 
of this verse says this, I give you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and on the full force, oh, praise God, the full force of the enemy. Hey, how many people are saying, well, you know, the devil sent this and the devil's trying to do that and the devil's doing this to the church and the devil sent this and the devil's throwing that. Well, that's fine and dandy. Get up and tell us everything the devil's doing. Get up and describe for us everything. Just put your finger on everything the devil's doing. I got a verse for you. Jesus has given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and the full force of the enemy. Let's not declare what he's doing. Let's declare what we're doing. <laughs> we're going to put our foot back on his neck. Amen. He has no authority. We have, God has given us through Jesus Christ his authority. Amen. And I don't want to uh, lose claim to it. I don't want to surrender it to the enemy. Nothing will hurt you. I want to tell you, Jesus was more than, than a man. Man, I love that song. That's an oldie, but it's a goodie. He was more than just a man. If you're watching, you've ever heard that song. Just He was more than just a man. Check it out. What the disciples learned in their daily lessons and practical experiences revealed to us in the Word of God. However, we may also grow in our understanding of his Godhead and glory as we learn more about this one who was more than just a man. In fact, let's read Ephesians verses, uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 18 and 19, I believe it is. Ephesians 1 and 18. Look at this. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory in, of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. You know what that's saying? Jesus is above everything. That's what that's saying. Jesus is over and above everything. He demonstrated his authority over the storm. You know why? Because the storm was under him, and it was a revelation of his deity. That's why the disciples turned from the storm to Jesus. Oh, that you would turn from your dilemma, whatever it is, Jesus is bigger than that. It was also it also served as a confirmation of his authority over every situation. And there's power in knowing Jesus, who Jesus is, and having confidence that he's able, I said he's able to do anything. In fact, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Look at this. Who is the image of the invisible God, visible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Somebody say all things. Yeah, I heard you. All things. It's not hard to believe that Jesus has the final word when we recognize that Jesus is the creator of and, and the ruler of all principalities and powers. But he's not only that, he's the creator of all the elements of nature. Yes, he is. The one who spoke, let there be in Genesis, is the same one that spoke peace on the Sea of Galilee. Now, it can be quite disconcerting to realize that we know who Jesus is and what he can do, and even proclaim that in our belief system, and then allow circumstances, think now, to throw us into despair and anxiety. How can we know who Jesus is and proclaim it in our belief system and testify on our Facebook page and tweet about him? But then when we're in a storm, it's like we forgot who he is. Knowing who Jesus is and being in relationship with him can bring a calm in the chaos of our lives. I'm praying it happens today. His victory over death and the sacrifice of Calvary make us triumphant more than more than conquerors. Amen. In fact, take a look at Colossians 2 verse 
verses 12 through 15. Colossians 2, 12 through 15. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespass, trespasses, excuse me, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way. Amen. Nailing it to his cross and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That's the God I serve. He made a display. He spoiled principalities and made a display of them openly. That means Jesus disarmed principalities. I want you to think about it. You're fighting an enemy who doesn't have any arms. He, he doesn't have any weapons. I want you to think about it. Jesus disarmed him. I'm glad he's with me. The sudden impending disaster of the storm that arose in the disciples' lives, even it indicates that it was more than just a storm. Not only was Jesus more than a man, this was more than a storm. I want you to notice this. The violence of this storm was indicated by the way the disciples responded to it. They had no doubt experienced many storms and dangerous waves. They were fishermen. What made this storm so different? The passage translation includes this note of Mark 4:37. It says this, This gale of wind and ferocious tempest was demonic in nature as Jesus was about to confront a powerful principality on the other side of the lake. I want you to think about that. Matthew called this storm a, the Greek word is seismos in the Greek. You know what that means? It's the same word translated earthquake in Matthew 24, 27, and 28. Literally, this indicated that the storm was like the rolling upheaval of an, uh, an earthquake or a tsunami. It was an unusual storm. These spirit, experienced fishermen, this wasn't just a normal storm. This was an, an unusual storm. And the indication is, is that Jesus was going to confront a principality and a power on the, on the further shore and this storm was a demonic uh, uh, intrusion in the purpose of Jesus Christ. Now, now, take note of this. Think about your current storm. You just think, well, God has just forgotten who I am. He's letting all this happen. How would God allow you? Blah, blah, blah. Sorry, I, I digress for a moment. I, and, and we start thinking about God must not love me and God must not care. Wait a minute. If this is going, think about this storm. If if this storm was a hindrance to what was about to happen, I want you to think about everything going on in your life. Jesus is about to confront a principality that has people bound, a community bound. And this storm is a demonic force to keep him from his purpose. Think about all the storms in your life. Think about what God is trying to do that we are being hindered, and affected, and listen, I want to tell you, be confident, be sure in the storm. God has a purpose. Oh, I feel his presence. He has a purpose for your life. And God has something special. God has something anointed that's about to happen. A great outbreak. You may be just around the corner from your children coming to know the Lord, or a great miracle you need in your body, or a great miracle in the church, whatever it may be. The storms are just indications that you're about to see something great happen. Keep on being faithful. Oh, praise God. Somebody say, praise God. This storm was a spiritual attack against the Lord of glory. And yet Jesus remained calm, so calm that he was asleep during a demonic attack. It was the disciples who awakened him. They were the ones that were afraid. Think about that. In our hearts, when we feel that we too are under spiritual attack, I know what pops into my mind. Well, I'm not Jesus. No, I'm not. <laughs> but Jesus dwells in me. Amen. John 14, 
Oh man, we got to read it. John 14 verse 15. Look at it. If you love me, keep my command, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Jesus states that the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the spirit of truth that the believer will be given is nothing more than Jesus Christ. Think about that. He states, you know him. He dwells with you. He shall be in you. I will come to you. No, I'm not Jesus but I have Jesus inside of me by the power of the indwelling Holy Ghost that makes all the difference in the storm. Oh, praise God. That makes all the difference in the storm. Not only that, I have this promise. Hebrews 13, 5, let's see. I think it's 5 and 6. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. I have this, I have this promise. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. The Lord is my helper. Oh, I'm praying this just go deep in you today. Knowing that Jesus will never leave us should give us contentment, boldness, peace. Jesus stood and rebuked the waves. The word for rebuke here is used, same used in Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 9, and Luke chapter 4, where Jesus cast out demons. The storm was an attack of Satan, and Jesus simply rebuked the evil and restored peace and calm with one command. What a powerful thing. In context of that, the spiritual confrontation on the lake was a prelude to what was about to happen. You know the story. Upon arrival on the coast of the other side of the lake, Jesus immediately encountered a devil-possessed person in the countryside of the Gadarenes. In Mark, we find the narrative where it says he meets a man possessed with a legion of devils who was tormented and confined to live in the graveyard. He, they couldn't chain him. He'd rip his clothes off and they'd rip the chains and he would terrorize the community. No one desired to be around him. He terrorized people. The demons recognized the authority of Jesus and pled. They uh, pleaded with Jesus, let us go into the herd of swine rather than being cast out. And Jesus sent these demons into the swine. Everybody saw the same man delivered. The Bible states this clothed and in his right mind. Everybody saw it. But notice what happens. The most astounding part of the story is the response of the people of the Gadarenes. The Bible states this. They were afraid and they began to plead with him to depart out of their region. Think about that. They were more comfortable with the demons than with the deliverer. They could tolerate the screams of a possessed man running through their community in the middle of the night, but they resented the sacrifice of their pigs, their swine. I want to tell you, the spiritual conflict of this story reveals the tension between the prince and power of the air and the prince of peace. Amen. The prince of peace. And it really is no conflict. Amen. When Satan has done all he can do, Jesus just speaks a word. The storm is calm. When Jesus hits the shore and the demonic man comes running out of the tombs, Jesus speaks a word and the situation is solved. This is something Jesus emphatically desires for us to realize. Please know it. Please let it get down in your spirit, especially right now. And when the 70 disciples whom Jesus sent out returned, rejoicing that demons were subject to them, Jesus seemed to minimize the miracle. They said, oh, we cast out devils. He placed more importance on the fact that their names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He explained, 
I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Like lightning emphasizes how quickly Satan fell from his high place. He was grounded, neutralized. That's what Jesus is saying. In addition, Jesus promised power. He said, I'll give you power over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So as we draw to a close, I want you to know four things as you watch this, as we close it out. First of all, Jesus has all authority over all powers. He is the Prince of Peace. No storm is too great. The storm even may be a spiritual attack. Amen. And there's some I'm speaking to right now that are in a storm, and you know it's a spiritual attack. He's the Prince of Peace. Jesus recognized the spiritual adversity behind the storm. He took authority over it. He'll do the same in your life. The second thing, as the Prince of Peace, he holds the position of royalty. In the text, the prophet pre uh, predicted that the government, the text that we read, Isaiah 9, 6, he says, the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name sh shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then it states this, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Thirdly, as the Prince of Peace, Jesus holds the position of authority. When speaking to his disciples after the resurrection, Jesus stated in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Don't ever forget that. And lastly, Jesus confidently spoke from a position of victory. Victory. God sees both the beginning and the end. He knows the final outcome. The battle belongs to the Lord. Death will be defeated. Jesus will prevail over all opposition. That's the truth of the matter. I want to read Romans 8. Well, that's a familiar chapter. Romans 8 and verse 38 and 39. Very familiar passage of scripture. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Can somebody say amen? Well, let's wrap this up. I'll close with this story. In Israel's history, David stands alone as the most prolific and heroic figure in the glory days of conquest of Israel. As a successor of King Saul and after many successful military campaigns, the enlargement of their occupation grew throughout the territories. The people sang songs celebrating David's accomplishments. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. He became a powerful king to be feared and admired. And after many years of numerous military and political successes, David had an ultimate desire that would not be fulfilled. God would say no. He desired to build a temple, a house for the Lord in Jerusalem. And while his desire was noteworthy and pleasing to the Lord, David was not the man for the job. In fact, God reminded him that he was a man of many wars and conflicts. David recounted his conversation with the Lord when he stated this, but God said to me, you shall not build a house for my name because you have been a man of war and have shed blood. David secured the site for the construction in Jerusalem, whose name means city of peace. The temple of the Lord is not going to be a place to honor military conquest, but rather it was going to be a place of peace. It would be a center of worship for a nation, a house to honor God. It would be built by one who was named Solomon. Solomon was King David's son, and his name meant peaceful. Yes, a man of war can't build that house. This is a house of peace built by a man who was the king's son, whose name meant peaceful, a type of the prince of peace. Solomon was a man of peace, was known for his wisdom. He built up the nation of Israel, formed treaties with other nations, increased their strength, and secured their borders. He ordered the building of the temple of the Lord. He saw the temple completed. In the spectacular dedication of the temple, 
Solomon prepared the sacrifice for the Lord. And the Bible says God accepted the sacrifice and the worship and consumed the sacrifices with fire. And the scripture says this, immediately the glory of the Lord filled the house and the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. You see, dedication in a place of worship will bring the presence and power of the Prince of Peace. He wants to reside with you today. He doesn't dwell in temples made of brick and mortar and stone any longer. He dwells in the hearts of men, and he wants your heart to be at peace right now in this day and hour. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the power of your word now. Thank you, Lord, that it is a word fitly spoken. It is especially for us right now in this moment. Lord, and while we're in a world that's, that is changing every day, and we don't have a secure future, we're not sure what's going on. And Lord, in a, in a world where the storms are, are, are blowing and the, the wind is blowing and the waves are beating against the vessel of our boat, God, I thank you for this lesson, this word of peace, God, this calm and confidence that you speak into our hearts even now. I pray for those right now that are in a spiritual battle. Let them know, Lord, that they're only in this battle because there's a future victory that's just, just around the corner. If they'll be patient, and wait on you. I pray you touch every person that's been a part of this study. I thank you for the time they've invested in it. I thank you for your word that gives us wisdom to walk, walk the way you would have us to walk, to live the way you'd have us to live. Keep us, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of this study. I pray it's been a blessing to you in your situations of life. May God richly bless each of you.